In today's lesson, we're going to be looking at how the grammar of a language can be expressed using both syntax diagrams, or BNF, which stands for the Bacchus nor form. And we're also going to be looking at how reverse Polish notation, RPN, can be used to carry out the evaluation of mathematical expressions. Now, both of these are used at the syntax analysis stage to ensure that the tokenization process doesn't show any errors in the original source code. And based on these, the compiler will output either an error message or will accept tokenized code for code generation. So let's start by looking at syntax diagrams. And these specify the grammatical rules for a programming language. And these need to be set out clearly so that a programmer can obey those rules and write code which is error free. A compiler can be built to check that a program obeys these rules and it can do that by comparing the tokenized code to what the syntax diagrams or perhaps the BNF form states. Now, each element in the language has a diagram showing how it is built. For example, on screen you see a simple variable can consist of a letter followed by a digit and that would be shown as simply variable a rectangular box with letter in it, followed by another rectangular box with digit. Now the letter itself will need to be defined, so we could simply say the same thing, letter on a line, and then this letter can contain A or B or C. So when you're showing alternatives, you're just going down and creating boxes or nodes, circular nodes, depending on what it is. If it's a base element, for example, there is nothing lower than that, then we normally denote it via a circular node. Otherwise, if it consists of other objects, for example, a variable can be a letter or a digit, and then the letter can be A or B or C. A cannot be broken down any further, so the letter will consist of circular nodes, and the variable will consist of rectangular nodes. The arrows signify the direction of travel, so variable consists of letter followed by a digit. Now, hopefully this is pretty clear. Digits can only be one, two, or three. So if I wanted to follow this rule, my variable can be A1, A2, or A3, B1, B2, or B3, C1, C2, or C3. It cannot be anything else apart from that. Now, an assignment statement could be shown as an assignment is when a variable equals another variable, an operator, and another variable. For example, total is equal to total plus sum. And alternatives for an operator could be shown as operator can be either a plus or a minus or a star or a divide. So syntax diagrams are pretty easy to create and pretty easy to read. Now here's another one. You could also show repetition as well as alternatives in a syntax diagram. So, for example, a variable can be a letter followed by another letter or any number of digits. The alternatives are rectangular boxes which pile upwards or downwards and the arrows which denote repetition. So, in this case, you're basically saying that the first one has to be a letter, then it can be any number of letters or any number of digits. So, it could be A1, A1, that's a valid variable name, or A123, that's a valid variable name, or A, A, A is a valid variable name. So any particular combination is possible and you can denote that by simply creating a stack of different types and arrows to denote a loop. Now BNF is basically an alternative to syntax diagrams. So think flowcharts and pseudocode. BNF uses a set of symbols to describe the grammar rules in a programming language and the notation includes is a less than and greater than sign. You use that to enclose an item. Colon, colon, equals separates an item from its definition and the straight line between items indicates a choice or the semicolon is at the end of a statement which indicates that this is the end of the rule. Now let's consider a simple variable which consists of letter a, B, or C, followed by digit 1, 2, or 3, in line with our syntax diagram earlier. Now we can write this in BNF simply by saying variable with the less than and the greater than signs, colon, colon, equals, this item is equal to the letter item, followed by the digit item. And then we make sure we have a semicolon at the end which says this rule is now complete. 
Similarly, the letter item can be defined by simply saying A or B or C, and the digit can simply be one or two or three. Now that rule is pretty straightforward to see, much more simpler to read for us humans, and we can understand the logic a lot more clearly. BNF can also be used as a recursive definition where an item definition can refer to itself. For example, a variable which can consist of any number of letters could be defined as variable, which is going to be equivalent to a letter or a letter followed by the variable again. You call it again and this is recursion. So you're calling itself, you go back to variables definition again, which could be another letter or it could be a letter and a variable. So you can have A or A plus a variable. So A, 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 all of that's possible. Now we can do that with numbers as well. So on screen you see an example that does exactly the same thing with numbers. So here we're considering the integer 147. This is basically a single digit integer, 1, followed by the integer 47. But 47 itself can be a single digit integer 4 followed by another single digit integer 7. Thus all the integers of more than one digit start with a single digit and then they are followed by an integer. Eventually the final integer is a single digit integer. So we can define this indefinitely long integer as an integer is the equivalent of a digit followed by an integer. To stop this ongoing process because this will be an infinite loop we need to simply write that an integer can be a digit or a digit integer. Just like we said, a variable can be a letter or a letter variable. Now we can modify this further. We can also look at signed or unsigned integers, plus or minus, for example. We can simply say an unsigned integer is a digit or a digit followed by an unsigned integer. And the digit can be specified as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, one of those. And if you wanted to kind of modify it even further, we could simply now say an integer is an unsigned integer or a signed integer. And a signed integer will simply be a plus symbol followed by an unsigned integer or a minus sign followed by an unsigned integer. And the unsigned integer itself can be a digit or a digit unsigned integer. And the digit can be 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 or 7 or 8 or 9. Now that modification allows us to store both positive and negative numbers and that rule is very easy to follow once it's written up. Hopefully this makes it clear how BNF works. In the exam you will need to go through a BNF statement and then maybe identify what values pass it or fail it and the other thing you will need to do is perhaps construct a BNF statement based on a scenario. So you need to remember those notation rules. Another example that you might encounter is here's a syntax diagram converted into BNF or vice versa. Okay, that's enough about BNF. Let's move on to reverse Polish notation. This method is used to represent arithmetic or logical expressions without the use of brackets or special punctuation. Now think about basic arithmetic, something like 5 plus 7. You've got an operand then you've got an operator plus and then you've got another operand and we can just work it out because we've been taught that way that okay you've got to add these two numbers together but that can become ambiguous for a computer and to simplify that we use RPN. RPN is an example of postfix notation that means that instead of being the infix notation where the operator is in the middle of the two numbers you have the operator at the end of the two numbers. So here, for example, if you wanted to do A plus B, we would write it as AB plus. So remember the traditional form is called infix notation, that's A plus B. That's how we are taught how to do maths, but we can also do it using postfix notation or something else which is called prefix notation where the operator comes before the two operands. Now, why do compilers use RPN instead of infix notation? That's because any expression can be processed from left to right without using any backtracking. We don't need to kind of go back and fetch the operand. You just know that the, these two are the operands and the next one is operator. So as soon as you hit the operator, you just do something on the previous two operands. So we could implement it using a stack basically, and we'll look at that in a moment as well. Now RPN can be formed by using operator precedence. You go in the same order, brackets first, multiplication and division, addition and subtraction. 
So the expression a minus b star c star has the highest precedence and this becomes a minus bc star and then bc star can now be considered as a single item. So you now have a b c star and then the minus sign. That's how you would simplify that expression using postfix notation or RPN. Now to evaluate that particular expression using a stack, the values are added to the stack in turn going from left to right. So what we do is we simply say, well, okay, the first value A will go in, then the value B will go in, then the value C will go in, then we'll use the operator star on B and C, and then whatever the result of that is, that goes into the stack, and then we will use the operator minus on the remaining two values, which is A and the result of B times C. Now this keeps on repeating until there is a single value left at the stack, and that basically means that the expression has been evaluated. So we're just using the same methods that you would encounter in a stack, push and pop. So the operands are pushed into the stack, and as soon as we encounter an operator, we pop the last two values out of the stack. So it's very easy to code this. Let's look at a worked example basically. So instead of A, B, and C, we have values two, three, and four, and our expression A, B, C star minus is evaluated using this particular approach. So first we push the operand two, or the value of A into the stack, then we push B into the stack, which is three, then we push four into the stack, so it's two, three, and four. Then we encounter our first operator star, and we then pop three and four out. Three times four is 12, that gets pushed back into the stack. So now you've got two and 12 in there. And then we encounter our final operator, which is minus. So we simply subtract those 12 minus two gives you minus 10. And that means there's only one expression left in the stack. And that is your answer. Very easy to do. In the exam, you will need to evaluate these type of expressions. You'll be given some values. Either you will have to push them into the stack and pop them when the operator is encountered and then simplify them into one value. I mean, you could do that mentally as well, of course, but they want to see that in this type of way where you are actually using a stack and you'll be given the diagram, an empty stack, and you will have to write the values in. Now let's look at another example. Here the expression is a plus b in brackets multiplied by c minus d in brackets. So this one can become a plus b because you resolve the bracket first and then you get cd minus, that's the second bracket, and then you have star because you're multiplying both of them together. So using the values two, three, four, and five for a, b, c, and d, the stack is as follows. So pause the video and see whether you get to the same answer and if this actually makes sense. So we're pushing the value two first, then we push the value of b, which is three into it, then as soon as we encounter the operator plus, we pop those two values out and we add them, and we push the value five back into the stack. Now we push the value four, which is C, then we push the value five, which is D, and then we encounter our next operator where we pop those last two values, five and four out. We do something with it, which is a subtraction, and then we push the result back into the stack. Now we've got two values, five and minus one, and then we encounter our final operator star, and we multiply both of them together by first popping them out, and then pushing the result back into the stack. So the answer is minus five. Now there's only one value left and that's your answer. Now it's all well and good listening about all these but you might need to try these out. So on screen there are a few examples for you to do on your own. Draw the syntax diagram to represent a variable that must start with the letter i, j or k only and that is then followed by up to three digits 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. Similarly once you made the syntax diagram try to represent that using bnf. You can also convert the following expressions to RPN, a plus b plus c times d, or brackets a plus b plus c, close brackets times d, or brackets a plus b times d, plus brackets a minus b, close brackets times c. You could also evaluate the above expressions using the values a is equal to seven, b is equal to three, c is equal to five, and d is equal to two using a stack. Syntax diagrams, BNF and RPN aren't very tricky to handle. They're actually very easy to do once you get the hang of it. And I hope you got that in this particular lesson. If you do want to check your answers, feel free to write them down in the comments and I'll check them for you. And that's the end of today's session. Hopefully you know how syntax diagrams and BNF work to simplify the grammar of a language and why a compiler 
needs them and how a compiler uses RPN to evaluate expressions so it avoids backtracking. As usual, if you don't understand anything, do get back to me, else I'll see you in the next lesson.